Hello, and welcome to the Linux command line video series. In this video, we will look into how to view and reuse the previously executed commands. We will also look at how to manage various jobs and processes that are running on the system. Please help me out by hitting the subscribe button so I can stop biting my nails. In the Linux shells, there is a concept called history that keeps track of the executed commands. This is so that you can use the information from previous lines in composing new ones. You can type the command history to list out the previously typed commands. If you are performing incidents response, you will probably want to save the output to a file so we can do analysis on it later. So history redirect into term one underscore history dot text. And then we'll go to more that same file. You notice that the previously typed commands are listed according to their order of execution, as you can see in the number on the left hand side. That number is called the event designator, and it can be used to run new commands. For example, if we want to rerun the command listed as number 37, you can just type exclamation mark 37. And the shell will execute the command from line 37 again. If you want to repeat that last command, you can type two exclamation marks. If you want to execute the last command that started with a certain word, you can type exclamation mark and then that command. For example, cat. And the shell will go back in time to the most recent command that started with cat and re-execute that. Let's say you want to execute a previous command that contained a certain keyword, you can type exclamation mark, question mark, and then that keyword. So for example, if I want to type exclamation mark, question mark, cfred, C-F-R-E-D, because I know that is the name of an image that I had used previously. If you're looking for a prior command but need to make some modifications to the command line before executing, you can search for that command with a keyword by using Control R and then that keyword. So for example, I'm going to do Control R C F R E D. This will basically go back in time and give you the last occurrence of C F R E D anywhere on that command line. If the display shows the command that you're interested in running, you can just hit the enter key to execute that command. If this is not the command you're looking for, you can hit Control R again, and it will continue to go back in time looking for the second last occurrence of a command that has the keyword in it. If you want to edit the command before executing, you can hit Control A to put the command on the command line with the cursor at the beginning of the line. And then you can go ahead and make your edits before hitting Enter. Alternatively, if you hit Control E, it will put the command on the command line with the cursor at the end of the line, and you can start your edits from there. Another way to make modifications to a command is using the caret characters, which will substitute the text between the first two carrots with the text between the last two carrots from the previous command. So let's say I go ahead and execute a command call md5sum, and then I point it to the folder slash mnt p1 slash capital S star. This will perform the md5 sum of everything that starts with a capital S in that folder. Now let's say I want to rerun that command again, but I want to run the SHA-1. What I have to do is do caret md5 caret SHA-1 caret. This will make the substitution of md5 with SHA-1 and then execute the command. The number of commands displayed will go all the way back to when the shell you are in was initiated up to a limit set within your environment. And you can see what that limit is by typing echo dollar capital hist size. In the case of the cane distro, this variable is set in the user's bash shell rc file so you can change it if you like. 
Another tip for using the history command, especially in the digital forensics and incidents response world, is if you want to get the actual executed time and date of the commands. To do this, we will set a special environment variable. So I'm going to type export hist time format equals double quote percent F space percent T space double quote. What this is going to do is add a date and time stamp to the history output. This information is already recorded in the system and just not displayed by default. Now if we type history again, the output would be more useful to create a timeline analysis for digital forensics and incidents response purposes. Now let's take a look at some commands that look at what processes the system is currently running. The top command will display the real-time view of all the processes that are currently managed by the kernel. By default, the processes using up the most CPU time will be on the top of the list. This list is refreshed every three seconds by default. The first line of the display starts with the current system time. And then it shows you the uptime of the system in days, hours, and minutes. Next comes the number of users logged in currently. And the last set of data is the system load average over the course of the last minute, 5 minutes, and 15 minutes. For the most part, if you have nothing running on your system, then the load average will be close to zero. If you have just one process that is using up the CPU, then that number will probably be around one. If you see the load average go over three or four, that's usually a sign that some processes are running that you may not want running. The lower portion of the display shows the commands that are actively using your CPU. By default, the list is sorted by processes using the most CPU time. Viewing this display will give you a good idea of what processes are using up the most resources on your system. If you want to sort by memory usage, you can hit Shift M or capital M for memory. And if you want to go back by sorting by CPU, you can hit Shift P or capital P for processor. When you're done with looking at the results here on top, you can hit Q to quit or Control C to terminate the process. On a Linux system, because you can have multiple users logged in at the same time, as well as having one user log in multiple times, all these users can take up resources. To see what's running on the system, you can run the ps command to display the current processes. Running ps by itself will show all the processes that the user is running in that shell. This will give the basic information of process ID, the terminal where the command is being executed from, the amount of processor time this command has used, and the command itself. If you do PS with a dash F option, this is going to give you the full format, which means more fields of information as well as the arguments to the commands. If you run PS dash E, the E option is going to allow you to see the processes for everyone else on the system. And the options can be combined, so you can run ps-ef. A common reason for why you would run the top or ps command is because you have a process that's running that you no longer want. To terminate that process, you can use the kill command. First, you need to identify the rogue processes PID or process ID by running the ps command. Then you can use the kill command with that PID. So I'm going to type kill dash 9 of that particular process ID. The dash 9 option is for the signal level you want the kill to operate at. This number can range from 1 to 64, with 9 being the most severe. And that's the one I usually use. There's no point messing around with other kindler and gentler signals. Historically, before a Unix user had access to multiple terminals, they only had one shell to do their work. If you are running a program, that program would be in the foreground as it occupies the terminal until it's done. If you want to do something else, 
you had to wait for that program to finish or put that program into the background or stop that job so that you can get the command prompt back. To stop a foreground job, you can hit Control Z where the job is running. So in this example, I'm going to do tail dash F of slash var log messages, redirect that to slash dev slash null. And this is going to run forever, so I'm going to hit a Control Z. Now you notice that the command prompt is back, so that particular job is stopped. I'm going to run another command sleep space inf this command is also going to run forever so i am going to hit control z to also put this in the background another way of putting a job into the background is when you initiate the command by adding an ampersand at the end of the command so for example if i do dd if equals slash dev slash u random of equals slash dev slash null I'm going to add an ampersand at the end, and then when I hit enter, this command is going to run, but it's going to run in the background, so I will immediately get my command prompt back. So now I have a couple of jobs that are running in the background or stopped. How do I see what those are? You can type the command jobs, J-O-B-S, and it will list all those active jobs in that shell. Jobs are different than processes in that each job is started by a user, whereas processes can be started by the system or by other users. Each job can contain multiple processes, so it's just subtle differences uh, you should be aware of. So let's type jobs. We see that we have two stop jobs and one that's running in the background. To change a stop job into a background job, you can type BG and then that job ID. In this case, let's do BG% 2. This is going to put the second job listed here into the background. And if you want to continue a stop job, you can put that job into the foreground by typing FG and then percent job ID. So in this case, let's go ahead and do FG space percent 1. So this first job that was listed here is now running in the foreground, right? And it's obvious because our command prompt is not coming back to us. To kill a job in the foreground, you can use the kill command in another shell or use control C. So let's do that. So we've hit the control C. So now let's type jobs again. This time we're going to use the dash L command. So this is also going to list out the PID in addition to the job ID. So let's go ahead and kill background jobs using the kill command. So we can do kill-9 of the second job here, percent %2. And we can also do the kill using the PID. So we're going to do kill-9 and then the PID of the last remaining job. So just to be aware, if you're following along, uh, your process IDs are unique. So don't type the exact same numbers as I'm typing because your process IDs will be different on your system. If you want to reboot your machine or shut it down, you can use the shutdown command. Typing just shutdown will cause the system to power down in one minute. If you use the dash R option, that will cause the system to reboot instead of power off. You can tell the system to perform its shutdown reboot procedure immediately by doing shutdown now, or you can delay it by a number of minutes by doing shutdown and then either with or without the dash R, depending on what you want to do, and then plus five for the number of minutes. So you can do plus 9, plus 1, plus 17,000, whatever your choice is. Or you can set a time for it to shut down or reboot by typing shut down and then giving the time in the 24-hour format. So I'm going to do 1345, 
so it shuts down at 1.45 this afternoon. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video where we learned about process control commands. We used the history command to look at previously executed commands. We looked at how to modify previous commands to form new commands. We looked at the top and PS commands to display processes. We used the kill command to terminate processes. We looked at the jobs, FG, and BG commands to manipulate jobs. Lastly, we looked at the shutdown command to power off or reboot a machine. Hope you enjoyed it, and if so, click on the thumbs up icon to like this video. Please hit the subscribe button to get notified when the next video comes out. Also, please leave me messages in the comment section below so I know what you liked and didn't like, or what you may want to see in future videos. See you next time.